The story of this man became the basis for the outward form of the famous vampire Dracula, who, to say bluntly, terrified the Romanian lands and almost all of Europe. However, despite the outrageous cruelty, in reality, Vlad III, according to some researchers, was not incredibly scary as he is commonly portrayed. And by the way, about drinking human blood, in general, most likely an eerie fairy tale. Welcome to Flip Side of History and let's continue this episode where we will talk about Vlad Dracula or Vlad the Impaler and the state of Wallachia under this man's rule. The future vampire was born in Transylvania, in the family of the illegitimate son of a Wallachian nobleman, Vlad II and a princess of Moldavia. The father of Vlad III, or Vlad the Impaler, was a devout Christian and a member of the Christian knightly order of the dragon. The main task of the order was to fight against blasphemy and protect, first of all, Christian lands from attacks from the Ottoman Empire. Let us know that the word Dracul means dragon in Romanian and Moldovan languages. So Vlad II, as a prominent member of the order, received the second name Dracula, or Dracula. Therefore, the son was called Vlad Dracula, literally son of the dragon. While his father supported the Ottoman Empire, Vlad III himself, at the request of the Sultan, was at the Turkish court. Perhaps this is what left a mark on the fate and general ideas about life of Vlad Dracula. After his father was overthrown from the post of governor of Wallachia during the rebellion of the local aristocracy, he was murdered and his brother Vlad was firstly blinded and then buried alive in the ground. And from that exact moment it was enough. Vlad III vowed to take vengeance for the deaths of his father and brother. Well, of course, first he had to wait for his release from Turkish captivity, after which the future vampire began a real terror to gain power. With the support of Ottomans, Vlad III, who at the time was just 16 years old, in 1448, managed to overthrow the voivode of Wallachia, Vladislav II, and consequently take his place. True, the reign did not last long, only two months. Then the Hungarians returned the throne to Vladislav II, and Dracula himself was sent into a whole eight-year exile. Where Vlad the Impaler was all this time is not known for certain. There is fragmentary information that he traveled a lot both in the Ottoman Empire and also within the Bessarabian lands, namely Moldova. When Vladislav II unexpectedly went over to the side of the Turks, betraying his oath, Vladislav the Impaler, on the contrary, went over to the side of the Hungary. This gave him the opportunity to finally deal with a long-time opponent. During the fight, he cut off Vladislav II's head, and after that, Vlad Dracula began to rule Wallachia. But here's the thing. Despite the fact that legends speak of the transcendent cruelty of the Impaler, this was not so, or more accurately, not quite so. Firstly, when he began to reign, Dracula introduced a system of appointing ordinary commoners to high positions. This gave him the opportunity, without looking back, to promote or, on the opposite, to remove the posts of subordinates, to have a loyal and overall truly good team by intentions for the state that was also completely loyal to its master and finally even to put his officials to death penalty for serious offenses. More than that, in the most brutal way, Vlad III began to annihilate crime, in essence eliminating even such a thing as lying. At the same exact time, Dracula never forgot the oath to avenge the death of his father and the gruesome death of his brother. In order to put an end once and for all to those who had once committed a takeover in his homeland, he invited to his feast the high-ranking aristocrats of Wallachia who took part in the rebellion. And he even invited them all together with their wives and children. The official version was the festivities at the so-called Great Easter Dining. In total, about 200 people came as the guests to the palace. The banquet took place in 1459. By order of Dracula, women and old people were killed, and all of the representatives of the male part of the population were sent to grueling hard labor for the construction of the castle of Poinari. Almost all of the guests there died from inhuman working conditions and overtiredness. As mentioned before, Vlad the Impaler created a new elite of ordinary people and peasants. Obviously, first of all, he esteemed those who distinguished themselves on the battlefield. At the same time, Dracula solved many internal issues in such a way that even his contemporaries had blood running cold in their veins. In order to eradicate bagging and the issue of homelessness once and for all, according to medieval legend, he ordained them together supposedly for a feast in a barn, which was then burned along with the guests. But what about Roma population? The Roma population, as for the most part homeless, not working and living not in accordance with rules, was almost completely destroyed on the orders of Vlad Dracula. 
The only option for the Roma people, or more precisely Roma men and their relatives, to save their own life was for men to join the army of Wallachia. And the German population who lived in the Wallachian lands, Dracula imposed excessively high taxes, and then began a real policy within his state of outright genocide, for nothing. According to certain papers preserved till our days, several villages were wiped off the face of the earth, and in total about several thousand Germans were killed. How Vlad Dracula dealt with any signs of disobedience can be concluded by the destiny of the city of Konstadt, present-day Brasov. When the inhabitants of this city on a massive scale supported not Vlad III, but another contender for the post of ruler of Wallachia, the city was captured and more than 30,000 people were executed, and Dracula himself dined surrounded by dying residents, simply watching their suffering. For defying of the trade laws of Wallachia on the orders of Dracula, the guilty German merchants were put on spears, and Dracula did this almost constantly. However, to complete the whole picture, it must be said that the innocent person was not doomed by such a fierce execution for absolutely no reason at all. According to the memoirs of one of the unknown authors of German origin who lived in the 15th century, Dracula liked to dine among dead criminals. While the smell of decaying bodies did not bother him a single bit, there is a legend, or maybe not, that when one of his officials or servants complained about the stench of corpses, Vlad III ordered him to be immediately put on the highest stake, while saying, And now the smell of rot won't reach you. As for the ways of eradicating crime in Wallachia, here Dracula, of course, was distinguished by almost uncomparable sadism of the time and inhumanity. For example, unfaithful wives or widows who found solace with other people's husbands were first subjected to cutting out the genitals and then both of them were skinned alive. Probably, by and large, these are just legends, but for a long time Romanian mothers frightened their children with the fact that if they did not obey, Dracula himself would come and take them. To believe or not that this feared man forced parents to eat their own children is a purely individual matter for each given person, as well as the fact that for irreverence an official or a servant or just a peasant could be punished more than rigorously. For one instance, if at a meeting with Dracula the hat was not removed in time, the nails were hammered into the head of the offender until the unfortunate person died. A humongous variety of different descriptions of how Dracula punished or, conversely, pardoned have come down to our time. It is known that he once had a long conversation with two wandering monks. The lord of Wallachia asked them what his subjects said about him. The answers were completely opposite. One monk told the truth, that he was considered a villain. The second, on the contrary, assured that Dracula was revered by the people as the wisest ruler out of all and liberator from the oppression of the Ottomans. According to legend though, the monk who told the truth was left alive and not harmed, and the second was ordered to be executed for deliberate lying. Another source says that the opposite happened. But how it really was and what happened, today is no longer possible to discover. There is another peculiar story when a merchant traveling through Wallachia was robbed. He, of course, complained to the ruler. By order of Dracula, they began to look for the thief, and the merchant was returned his wallet. But the man, merchant, realizing who was standing in front of him, carefully counted all the coins. It turned out that there was one more gold coin in the wallet, which the merchant immediately told. Vlad III appreciated the honesty of the merchant, telling him that the wallet was given on his personal order. The thief, without a doubt, was caught and killed, but the merchant heard the following words from the ruler of Wallachia. Good job for saying the truth, or otherwise you would be on your stake next to the thief. So what can be said with absolute certainty about Dracula's reign is that the locals feared him like fire. Because one of the reasons is that some ordinary people sinned, betrayed and lied in their lives, and other reasons include most likely way to cruel punishment and loss of one's life. And the unthinkable for modern person fight against any lie, tiny or huge, of the ruler of Wallachia was one of the dominant things which could be heard from mouths of people within any town or village. It is known for one example that the main attraction of the capital of Wallachia was a bowl of gold filled with water. Any resident could safely drink water from there, but nobody dared to encroach on the bowl itself. It got to the point that, on the orders of Vlad III himself, several gold coins could be deliberately thrown on the lively streets. With such insanely strict rules, Dracula ensured that during his reign in Wallachia there were basically no thefts and no crime as such. The inhabitants could not even pick up what laid on the ground, even at times if it was their own things, because it always demanded proof. Despite all the tries and the extremely violent ways against lies and crime, as well as support for trade, handicrafts and agriculture, the economical situation of Wallachia gradually rolled down. 
and the life path of the ruler ended after the Hungarians went over to the side of the Ottoman Empire. Wallachia was defeated in battle, and Vlad Dracula himself died in this battle. His head was cut off and taken to the court of the Turkish Sultan, while the body of the strictest and harshest lord was buried by monks. Let's move in the future. A few centuries later, archaeologists opened this grave in which a male skeleton without a head was discovered. It is believed that these are the remains of Vlad III. It was the information about this find that inspired the writer Stoker to write the novel Dracula, in which a really cruel and rather bloodthirsty tyrant, thanks to the writer, turned into the most famous vampire in the world. For the sake of fairness, it should be said that there is no documentary evidence that Vlad Dracula ever took a sip of blood. Therefore, here we can simply say about the creativity and imagination of the author. Also, despite the outrageous cruelty, the local Romanian Orthodox Church honors Dracula for saving the territories from the influence of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. You are watching Flip Side of History. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe and leave a like, and we see you later.